when you do this transformation, you you have to make a lot of bold moves, um, and and you have to also accept that a lot of things don't work. So you have to be fast in making corrections. Welcome to Manufacturing Happy Hour, the podcast where we get real about the latest trends and technologies impacting modern manufacturers. Manufacturing Happy Hour. Each week, we interview industry experts that are at the top of their craft and give you the tools, tactics and strategies you need to take your career and your business to the next level. And now your host, Chris Lukey. Hey, what's up? It's episode 68. Today, we're talking about tailoring, smart factories, and pivoting to entrepreneurship. Our guest today is Joachim Henge, a master tailor turned industry 4.0 leader. He spent over 24 years at Hugo Boss, moving from product development to serving as the managing director at their Izmir Turkey production facility, where he oversaw that operation's massive digital transformation. Now he's helping other leaders plan out and execute their own digital transformation journeys through Joachim Henge Consulting. There are a few things we're going to cover in today's episode. First, we're going to learn about Joachim's career and lessons learned from each pivot along the way. Second, we're going to talk smart factories and digital transformation. We'll discuss textile production and suit making, the importance of planning, curiosity, and digital twins when embarking on a digital transformation journey, then the outcomes that were a result of Hugo Boss's own Industry 4.0 implementation. Finally, we're going to talk about Joachim's career again, what it was like making a late career pivot to entrepreneurship, and why learning has been such a priority throughout his life. After this episode wraps up, if you're interested in connecting with Joachim or learning more, head over to the show notes page at manufacturinghappyhour.com slash 68. And if you enjoyed this episode or if you're a regular listener and you've been meaning to leave us a five-star rating and review for a while, head on over to manufacturinghappyhour.com slash iTunes to leave us a five-star rating and review at Apple Podcasts. You can do that on your desktop or on your iPhone, and it's super simple. In fact, I'm going to read you one of the recent reviews. That was short and concise. John recently said, great podcast. I listened to one show and was hooked and have also found a few other podcasts that are great along the way. Really enjoy the content, humor, guests, and more. Well, hey, thank you, John, for taking the time to leave that five-star rating and review. And if you, too, leave a rating and review, I will make sure to read those on the air. Again, that's over at manufacturinghappyhour.com slash iTunes. And with that, it's time to start today's conversation. We're going to take a little audio journey over to Joachim's home country of Germany to start today's discussion. All right. Joachim, Joachim, correct? Joachim. Yes, I just want to Joachim, make sure I yes. get this right. Joachim, I need, <laughs> yes. jo- Joachim, I'll, I'll, I'll probably pronounce it that way. I can't quite get the German pronunciation, despite no, being I German can't. heritage myself. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome to the show. Yeah. It's great to have you here. I've been, I've been wanting you. to have you on the podcast for a while after hearing all you had to share about digital transformation. You see the, your, your work at Hugo Boss now seems to be well known. So it's exciting mm-hmm. to have you here. I think folks are going to enjoy this episode. But before we get into tailoring and smart factories and manufacturing, I have to ask you, if we were having this conversation in Germany over a beer, where would that be? Well, that, uh, that's a quite, uh, as I, as I, uh, I was thinking about this this kind of question i think i'm rather a, a wine drinker but if i would take you to a beer for a beer then i would go to tübingen with you which is like 13 kilometers from here and we would have a drink at a private brewery which is very which is uh, at the at the um the neckar river and um it's a beautiful one it's not just nice and uh, it's not just a nice place it's an excellent beer i must say Sounds excellent. So are you saying it's actually on a river then? Is that, is that the setting? Exactly. It's right at right spot on the river and a very, very, his, the very historic part of Tübingen, which is a, like a thousand year old uh, city. Very charming. It's, it's, it's really nice. It's exactly. And, and a really nice uh, beer as well. <laughs> it's exactly what I envision when I think, uh, think about drinking in Germany. So, so let's <laughs> say we're, we're having that beer. Let's say we're you know, we could be somewhere else having wine as well. Any beverage will really yes. do in this scenario. Yes. But I, I always ask a question: if you can simplify 
the things that you're most involved in is if we're having a drink, how would you describe Smart Factory or Industry 4.0 in one minute or so? What does that really mean? So, I mean, there is, of course, if you go to Wikipedia, you find, a, you find an easy <laughs> a, answer to that as well. My take is um, on that from my experience that I had in, this, um, in Izmir was um, we have to digitize our business and we, and we cannot leave anyone behind, which mm-hmm. means like we have to think about everything we can think about in a factory to digitize, talking about digital twin later on to digitize and we cannot leave any person out of this equation from the janitor to the top manager, from the finance to the, to the engineer. Perfect answer. I feel like from my research, I feel like this is that, that doesn't surprise me as, as much as, uh, as much as it may others, right? Because I feel like a lot of the work you've talked about is around digital twin, but also the human side of the business and always particularly with something like tailoring and textiles, right? There's so much personalization to it, not only in the product, but the people behind it as well. So Uh, absolutely. I mean, our industry is very people heavy. You know, you have industries where you are machine heavy. Mm -hmm. And uh, like when you go into the, when you go into the textile industry and you go into spinning and weaving, you can literally have a, a, a room with, hundreds of machines and there's one person overseeing it because basically everything is uh, is done automatically the machines are reloading themselves automatically when it comes to spinning and in weaving you have lots of machines and there are like one or two people checking and cleaning a little bit and something like that the rest is done automatically when you go on a shop floor on a on, of assembly like production then you have basically one machine one person or even like sometimes when you go to asia one machine Two, two people. So we are really talking about, when we talk about this industry, if, if you forget um, the apparel industry, if you forget people, then, then you're never going to make it. <laughs> That's very easy. Yes. And, and we're going to take a deep dive into that here in about yeah. three or so questions. But I, mm-hmm. I first want to get to know you a little bit, because I think this is a historic moment on Manufacturing Happy Hour. We've never had a master tailor on the show before. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> Probably true. It's also not, uh, not the usual um, career path uh, to end up in digitalization when you start being a tailor. So um, I, um, I, I must say I was always very creative in my, my life and I wanted to study art in the beginning. Then my uncle said, okay, you can be an artist, you can become an artist, but probably you will not become very like wealthy or let's say you will not earn too much money. And I didn't like this when I was 19. <laughs> so I thought, okay, how can I combine creativity and, um, and a kind of well-being, financial well-being? And then I thought, okay, then why not dive into fashion? Because there are lots of fashion designers at that time, very much like Karl Lagerfeld and Jill Sander and other German um, designers. So I decided to become a tailor and, um, and because I was always intrigued by how it's made, I didn't decide for studying tailoring, but really becoming a tailor, literally sitting on a table for hours and hours and stitching a suit. And, and two things that I learned that I liked here very much was first, there's nothing closer to a single piece flow than being a bespoke tailor because you have exactly one customer you have one product. There's no whatsoever outlet. There's no excuse. If this product doesn't fit this particular customer, you're out of business. It's not going to, there's no business. So I learned a lot about details and I learned a lot about con- customer centricity, let's say. And, uh, and, and so, so with that, I, um, I decided for, for continuing this. And there's a German in the German Chamber of Handicrafts. You can apply for a master certificate, like becoming mm-hmm. a master tailor. So I really mastered this. And then there was a guy from a shirt company. He said, listen, you can become a, ta- you can become a tailor and do your own shop, but why not um, uh, automize yourself? Or let's say industrialize yourself a little bit so that you have a better process in making suits, not only doing things by hand. So he suggested me to go into the industry and then in the industry, a full new picture appeared like, oh mm-hmm. my gosh, I can, be, I can be so creative on scale, not just for singular people, but for many people that I uh, decided uh, to stay there. And then based on that, 
well, I went into product development. Um, uh, later on, I uh, we are going to talk about that for sure. But later, mm -hmm. then I went into management, and uh, I was attracted by technology and da -da -da, lots of things coming in the next minutes. Yeah, but yeah. this is how basically how 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 strange a, stra a career can be. Like you start from you want to be a painter or a tailor, like like an artist. And you end up uh, talking about industry 4.0. <laughs> yeah, it's it's life. it's a very interesting career evolution. It, it kind of makes sense a little bit, though, right? You said you started with that single piece flow. You mentioned, I think I've heard at one point you <clears throat> were looking to open your own tailor shop, essentially. But yes, then, this is absolutely. Yeah, and you and you pivoted, and I think you said it really well. You could do creativity at scale when you mm -hmm. were at Hugo Boss, right? I, I yes. guess one one thing I'm curious about is as as you scale up there and you look at going from product development to leading 4,000 people at the mm -hmm. Izmir Turkey plant, tell me what that was like, because I feel like I can see the evolution of going from a tailor to creativity at scale, but I feel like that next flip of leading 4,000 people must have been a, a bigger change. How was that? Yes, the, the, this was... I'd say I, I, this was overwhelming for sure. The first six months were a complete overwhelming situation. But why did it happen? Because I was always interested in cr in creating organizations. Not just. I mean, I started as I said. I started in the '90s with going from handcrafted pieces, handmade pieces, into industry, and then over time. I got interested in uh, creating not just products, but creating organizations, like thinking about skills, thinking about, I was head of pattern design department with like 25 people. So I did, I had to care about not what I would achieve, but my success was determined by what my people would achieve. Mm. Something that Simon Sinek uh, uh, absolutely rightly said is like leaders um, uh, don't care about numbers. Leaders care about the people who care about the numbers. And, and that, that was a very interesting thing, like creating organizations and thinking about the right people for the right skills, for the right to do's and something like thinking management, not from an economic part, but from a creation part, like creating organizations. So I became head of in 2000 and then um, um, head of product excellence. And then so from 20 to 30 to 50. And then in 2011, I went to a business school to learn more about general management in Switzerland uh, to, 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 um, to become more, more, let's say, experienced in this big thinking. And then in 2015, uh, I was going to leave Hugo Boss because I said, listen, I have done so many things here. So mm -hmm. why, would I, why would I say after 20 years, you know, that, that's it. And then, uh, and then they said, listen, we need someone for our factory in Izmir. And uh, so I, I basically came from 110 people that I was leading to 4,000 people that I was leading. So I had literally more managers than I had before people working with me. Oh, wow. Know? So that, so that was, um, and I will never forget the moment in the 1st of July in, um, uh, in 2015, when I was, did my introduction speech and I was standing in front of 4,000 people. Now, so when you stand in front of 4,000 people that you feel, I mean, you literally physically feel complexity and you feel responsibility and it is like a rock concert. You know, you have all these people looking at you, like whatever you say is, is you cannot excuse or you cannot take down, you cannot cut off. We can cut this recording here, but when you stand in front, in front of 4,000 people, you can't cut nothing, you know? Yeah. So we had, it was a very funny thing because we had a translator. I was giving my introduction speech in English and, uh, and we had a translator coming from Istanbul to put this into Turkish. And he was sweating blood and tears because he had also not never stood in front of 4,000 people. So we had this kind of uh, a very funny moment. And then I started to walk around and get familiar with this. And, uh, and what I felt was like, Two things. One is I, I will never understand in real time what all these people are doing. And the second thing is I have to build a mixture of delegation and control so that I can trust the organization that they do the right thing, but I don't wish for it. You know, so, so that was also the kind of fundamental belief when thinking about Industry 4.0 and when we talk about this digital twin and all this transparency and real-time management, that it was a kind of necessity to, to actually control this kind of group uh, to build these new tools and new means. 
I, I have a question. I want to ask about digital twin, but first, I think yeah. we need to give people a taste of of textile manufacturing and manufacturing suits and everything that Hugo Boss does. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to explain the process, but what's something about tailoring on a mass scale that surprises people maybe about the process, maybe something they envision is one way, but is actually another way. Yeah. So what, what very often uh, people cannot think um, about such a, uh, anyway, when we talk about suits here, which is one of the most complex products you can do on scale, mm -hmm. um, we have a very close and clear structure of processes and machine human interactions to actually mm -hmm. craft a suit. Mm -hmm. A suit, the fit of a suit, maybe you have worn a suit or maybe you bought a suit. The fit of a suit is determined by three things. One is the, the fit in pattern, like the making the, the style. The other part <clears throat> is, the, is the, the, the material, the raw material and the mm -hmm. inner materials that you have inside between the fabric and the lining, something that you don't see like shoulder pads, and horsehair in the beginning, in the, in, the, in the front, and some interlinings and something. And the third one is the machine-human interaction. Like you build fit during the process. It's a little bit like when you, when you think about the welding of cars, mm -hmm. you have a flat piece of metal. Yeah. You put it into this machine and it gets stamped. And all of a sudden, you have, I don't know, the front part of a, of, of a car. Something like that also happens in manufacturing a suit. You have flat materials. My fa fabric is literally flat. And then you have, uh, you have ingredients, you have machines, and you press, and you have steam and heat and something like that. And then you put it into a three-dimensional product. So it's a kind of from flat to 3D process that is, uh, that is actually um, cut into more than 300 operations. So wow. you have people sitting there. This is a big difference between when you talk about bespoke, where you have to know everything about a product. Mm -hmm. There's literally one person is doing one piece to the kind of thought, first industrial in, uh, revolution thinking, like I, I, I cut the operations to, to do a car into like hundreds, hundreds of operations. And one single person is doing one or two operations. That is also what happens when you look into, uh, into factories for, for apparel, like mm -hmm. when you do jeans, but also in, um, in, uh, in suits, in shirts very much, and in suits. So you, everything starts with, with, with a warehouse of fabric, then you have the cutting, then you have the preparation, then everything splits into singular components, like there are people making the sleeve, other people making the front piece, other making the collar, others making the, uh, the back, others making the pockets. And then there's a kind of combination in car in the car manufacturing. You call it the marriage of when you when you put the chassis mm -hmm. on uh, on the on the, the top and the bottom together. This is the same when you pre when you create a suit because there's the inner side when you open the suit inside, yeah. and there's the shell fabric, and there's everything is connected in the outer line of the jacket. And this is kind of when you go into a, when you go into a factory for suits. Then you see these all these components growing, and then comes one moment in time where everything is put together, and yeah. all of a sudden a jacket is put on a hanger. Yep. So this is kind of the same process. So it's very industrialized, um, very precise, very I mean, very much defined in terms of the operation itself. Very little surprise uh, coming from the from the hands of the of the people, mm -hmm. which is very different to the to the handmade features. Yeah, I, I think one one fact that stood out, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think you said like one third of the fit um, is determined by the uh, is it the operator determined by the operator, the tailor. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. when, and I found that fascinating, right? Because it is a very unique process. And admittedly, I thought about wearing a suit to this conversation. I have a handful, but I didn't feel anywhere nice enough for, for this discussion <laughs> for someone yes. that used to work with Hugo Boss. So I need to yeah. uh, up my suit game. But I think- No, 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 they, 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 this is okay. This is absolutely okay. The thing is that very often people see just, maybe you see 20 pieces of a, of a suit and it is made of probably a hundred, you know, there's lots mm -hmm. of things going on between the shell fabric and the lining that you don't see that actually create the fit. Yeah. And this is the, 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 the human machine interaction in the process. Well, this is a, a good segue into, let's say the industry 4.0 digital twin part of the conversation, because 
I've seen your TED talk. I've seen there's a good 20 minute video out there that I'll put in the show notes as you describe what you did at Hugo Boss for the digital transformation yeah. there. My question, though, is if I heard you correctly before you started, before you went into really transforming anything, you created a digital twin of the process. Is is that correct? Let's say I created a digital framework first, you know, digital I mean, then, framework. yes, because what I understood, I, you know, in 2014, I attended a masterclass about how to lead the factory of the future. I was at the mm. Siemens factory. I liked this very much. I fully understood the, the concept of the digital twin in this factory because I, I was literally there and I was looking into, and I was in a board, they had a boardroom for quality, which looked like NASA. You know, it was full of screens of what's running and what's working right now in this factory, which is the three shift factory, lots mm -hmm. of robots doing um, the semiconductors. So I thought I, I really understood, like, I can't stand in the factory and think and run around and see what's happening. And I can't stand in this room and look to all these screens. And I also understand what's going on. Yeah. So there is this, literally, there's this digital copy of what's actually physical happening, physically happening. Mm -hmm. And that is, what I, that is what I deeply understood. And when I started in 2015, that was my first framework that I started to work with. And, and we put into our offsite meeting for the strategy with the top management, like, how can we create this digital twin mindset of mm -hmm. really deeply understanding that whatever we can touch and feel and see we can actually also have as a copy in the digital world. When you that, say, that, yeah, that was the beginning. Yeah, when, when you say creating that mindset, this brings up another thing that, that I've heard you talk about before is creating a space of openness and curiosity yes. across all the people. How, how do yes. those tie in? How, how did you go about doing that with a 4,000 person facility and probably a lot of people up at headquarters you had to work with as well? Yes. Uh, I mean, I was uh, I, uh, on one thing. I was fortunate that I was 2000 kilometers away from the headquarters. So I could really like I had to report the finance, the financials and the quality and the lead time and whatnot. Uh, I mean, the KPIs once a month mm -hmm. and the rest was basically done by me. So I had I didn't have to convince bazillions of 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 um, of peers on top management level to uh, to to start moving. That's a good thing because you make, when you do this transformation, you, you have to make a lot of bold moves um, and, and you have to also accept that a lot of things don't work. So you have to be fast in making corrections. That's why the more people you involve on top management level, we all know that, the, the slower it gets, you know, in terms of agility. It's, it's not that it's a bad thing. I mean, it's a good thing to talk as many people, to talk to as many people as possible. But when it comes to agility, it's good you have speedboats. You don't want to have a Titanic, you know. Mm. So that so that was one thing. Um, really having a, having a team and being agile. And then one thing that I also immediately understood is like I have to craft a story that an existential threat story that everyone in the organization would understand and would support. And the story about that was very easy put there is always a cheaper country. For Turkey, it is an existential threat if you, can, if you do something that another country can also do just 20% cheaper. That's an existential threat. So coming from this story, when, when, you, when you realize like, I do an excellent job today, but if I just continue doing that and improving this, like I do my continuous improvement story. I improve my efficiency every, every year. And in five years, there are others coming and doing something completely different than me, just cheaper or better or whatever. I'm out of business anyways. No matter how hard I improve my lean activities and do one Kaizen after the other, mm -hmm. if I cannot find a reason why I exist in five years time, I will be out of business no matter what I improve. Mm. So, so I, I, so I built this existential question about who are we in five years' time to stay relevant in the portfolio of Hugo Boss. Mm -hmm. And in Izmir, we produce like 70% of the global production. So we had to stay relevant in the portfolio of Hugo Boss for my, for my colleagues at the headquarter. And we had to stay interesting in terms of the financials. And that turned into like, okay, we cannot 
just continue with Lean and Kaizen and whatever. We have to do things obviously different. And the difference here was we have to do something that a cheaper country cannot do. And that can be complexity. We, we bet a lot on complexity and we bet a lot on lead time. Cost is anyway something that you have to have under control, but it was about lead time and complexity. And if we would do something that another country would do for the same cost, but we could do so much more complexity because we can handle lower order sizes, we can have shorter lead times. For the same cost, people would always opt for us because they say, you know what, we have this capsule collection here. So a thousand pieces here, 50 pieces there. And we just uh, bring it, bring it. You know, while when you go to Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or, 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 or Thailand or Myanmar or wherever, or China, people would say, yeah, we can do this for you also for this price. But minimum order quantities is like 10,000 pieces. Mm -hmm. And when you go to your colleagues and say, yeah, listen, minimum order, minimum, minimum quantity is 50. Mm -hmm. You give them so much more freedom for their, uh, for their um, allocation. I think you brought up a great point that a lot of folks listening to this can learn from about in some ways with your, there's always a cheaper country comment. It's about figuring yeah. out what are, what are your differentiators, right? You know, there's exactly. always cost, right? You need it to be competitive, but you can do complexity and you can have an advantage on lead time as well. And I think many times people only think in terms of cost, unfortunately. Um, unfortunately, and they think about Industry 4.0 only about technology. Yeah. And this is just the tool. Well, the, go. The, this is not, it's, it's, it's not the reason for Industry 4.0 is not because there are computers on this planet. Mm -hmm. The reason is because our world, our world of consumers is getting more complicated. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we, and as a manufacturer, we produce for consumers. So if mm -hmm. we have more different consumers to, to, to handle, we need tools to handle complexity. And one mm -hmm. of the tools to handle complexity is digitalization. And off we go. But we don't start with digitalization. This is the tool uh, yes. ultimately. Mm -hmm. No, that, that's a huge point. I think our audience is pretty good at understanding that, right? I think we've done some digital transformation episodes before where people recognize it's not about technology for technology's sake, right? It's addressing the problem. It's uh, more productivity. It's better jobs for the people that are out on the floor. So I guess I yeah. have two questions around that, actually, then. What was the one of the most measurable outcomes of Hugo Boss's digital transformation? Mm-hmm. I mean, um, there were three that I could name. One was that our cost per minute uh, decreased while mm -hmm. the wages increased, while the inflation increased, while lots of costs increased, our cost per minute decreased. Mm -hmm. The second was that we had a way better right first time quota than we had in 2015. Mm -hmm. And the third one is that we had like double or triple the amount of complexity that we could handle in low order sizes that we can do in 250. So everything was investing on this story about existential question, why do I mm -hmm. exist at all? Mm -hmm. and, and if the market gets complicated, no one wants to talk about a higher wage, higher cost. Uh, we have to talk about um, fair wages. So we have to increase the wages for the operators and stay profitable anyways. This is a very fine balance of a lot of, you have a lot of stakeholders in play here. Mm -hmm. um, and these were probably the three ones that were the most important ones. What was the impact on the people specifically on morale, retention? What's maybe something you can highlight in that regard as well? Yeah. Mm, that was I, I had a funny funny discussion on us. We had a stakeholder conference with uh, with Hugo Boss, and there were there were some professors for sustainability, and they asked, of course, Rick's question immediately. Like, I made a presentation on Industry 4.0, what we do, and then immediately they said, Ah, but come on, with all this transparency, don't you think that your employees feel like like ho hollow? like completely gl glossy and glass, but like, like you, you measure every, um, every component of your factory, like also people data and something. So don't these fe people feel like measured, like robots? Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what? We had lots of interviews. We made lots of interviews and the people actually like it. And then she said, ah, this is just marketing talk. So can I come? 
And I said, yeah, come, please come. I mean, there are 4,000 people, ask them. I'm not, making, I make, I'm not making jokes here, come. So she came with three other professors and they spent 10 days uh, there. They came to, to uh, there were some others, they came actually twice. So they, they, they made a case study based on this. So they came and invited like, they interviewed maybe like 150 operators. And not just saying like, do you like it? They, they made very smart questions like, can you describe how this has changed your life? And da, da, da. so they made very smart, so to get really insights from the people. And basically what this, what this professor said is, she said the, the main outcome of the employees' minds was, I am my own manager. I need no one to ask for my performance. I don't have to go into the HR department to understand my, my, my pay slip at the end of the month because I've seen it before on my tablet next to my sewing machine. I know about my performance. I know about my, my efficiency. I know about my quality levels. I know about my skills. I can ask this thing about, my, about trainings. I, I am basically my own manager. I don't need a supervisor mm-hmm. to do that. And even if my needle breaks, I push a button like Amazon dash button and there will someone from, from, uh, from the logistics department will come and bring me some needles to make my job. So basically what they understood was and that's what I'm always emphasizing on when thinking about this transformation is they saw that this is an enabler to do their initial job better. Mm -hmm. And that was the convincing story also for everything. And we always, whenever we would put some technology into place, we would always think about the, and that comes from my history from Taylor. We would always look for the, for the end user to have a benefit because no one on the shop floor cares about the higher EBIT in the pockets of the owners or the, or the shareholders. Why would I care? What, is it, what does it have to be with my life? Mm-hmm. It ha- there's no relation to my life if someone else has higher EBITs. Yeah. But it has a big impact if my wage, my personal wage rises or my working conditions improve. Mm-hmm. That I understand no matter what kind of school level I have. Well, I like that it. is what we always made sure. And, and, and one thing I really like about that is empowerment was a big Absolutely. part of your answer that I heard, right? You know, now they are their own manager, right? And that's, that's a cool story. I didn't yeah. realize you had people coming in talking to 150 of your employees. So yes. for, for anyone out there that's debating digital transformation right now or figuring out how to do it, there's a good proof point right there for how this works. Um, yes, I, Absolutely. I, I, as as we get towards the end of the conversation, I, I have a handful of questions left, and maybe this segues well into what you're doing now as a consultant. Uh, mm-hmm. And we haven't really talked about all the actions people can take to implement a digital transformation today, because I, you know, I think we've done that on the show before, and you can talk at length in that in a lot of the webinars yes. that you do. But maybe something people don't necessarily get to hear all the time is what's maybe if you're comfortable sharing a mistake you made along the way or something you would have done differently that you can advise folks on that are looking at their own digital transformations going through them now that you'd say, Hey, keep an eye out for this. Yeah. So, so this is basically one of the reasons why I started my own firm and why I left Hugo Boss is Mm -hmm. because I understood that there is a big, big need for this digital transformation. And there's a huge misunderstanding because people always start with tech. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. what I do nowadays is like, I help organizations and companies and leaders in first crafting the plan, not starting with, you know, I have a, you know, I have a very, very huge customer in Sri Lanka. And he said, the CEO said, you know, every, every week someone else pops into my office and needs some money for digital investments. And I, I have no idea why I should say yes and no, b- b- because it doesn't make sense for me together. There's no overall plan to make this. And that was the first thing that I did in 2015 was to create a plan, a strategic plan and derived from that first an existential reason plan then a strategic plan, then the combination of digital transformation and human adaption. And then comes the question about 
what do I actually do? Like, what kind of software do I need? What kind of hardware? What kind of, which, which trainings do my people need? Uh, we deleted three levels of hierarchy. Mm. If you do that, if you delete levels of hierarchy, then there's a, this is a big, big job to actually redistribute jobs mm -hmm. and realign people and empower people in lower positions because you have that level above is just gone, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is what I do today with, 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 uh, with my, my, the clients and the companies that I work with is really starting with a plan. Right, right. No, it's, and you've made it very clear. It's not about the tech. It's about crafting the plan. I think that's been a great yes. theme through this interview. For anyone listening, um, we, we will link up to uh, Joachim Henge Consulting in the show notes so that people can get there. It's, mm -hmm. it's your first name, last name, consulting.com, I believe is where, easy, easy. where, uh, easy, easy. where people can find you. So we'll make sure that if, if you are looking for digital transformation advice, smart factories, industry 4.0, whatever you call it, that you have a way to uh, connect at the end of the episode. But my question around this is, what's it been like going through like a, a late stage career pivot, going from someone that spent 24 something years at Hugo Boss to now you're an entrepreneur? What's that been like? Yeah, that that is is, is a very different life. You know, one and a half years ago, I was surrounded by thousands of people and I found it natural to fly two times a week to mm -hmm. Germany. And I, th that was all just normal. Now I'm, uh, I'm working from home. Um, my web designer comes from Sri Lanka. Uh, no, so, sorry. My web designer is sitting in Jakarta. I have uh, some salespeople and connectors to clients in, in, uh, in Pakistan. My social media manager is working from Ankara, Turkey. My colleagues that <laughs> I work with in the assessment come from, come from Izmir, Turkey. I have a marketing and, and, and um, a person and salesperson in Portugal, and I'm sitting in Germany, and my clients are sitting everywhere. In other words, why I'm saying this, this explicitly is that the, this pandemic has changed the way how we think business and how we do business. And this is not going away. And while I was, for me, it was just normal to ask someone in a big corporate a question uh, one and a half years ago, for me, it is just normal nowadays to talk to four countries and one of our clients in one day and sitting still in my office. So that is the biggest change that has happened from being surrounded by this corporate world to being an entrepreneur and having to fix everything by yourself. But there has never, but from my point of view, there has never been an easier time to, 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 to start your own business than today. Because the acceptance, for example, for two, two years ago, the, the, there, has, there would have never been an acceptance from a manufacturer to work with a consultant 10,000 kilometers away. They would always say, you have to come. We cannot work with you if you don't see the factory by yourself. You have to come. And now, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm right now thinking about in January, I'm try, I will try something new, which is a very th new thing for me also, which will be digital Gamba walks. So mm. I will literally, I will literally, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm right now working on a, on a way to, to, to have literal uh, um, 3D virtual Gamba walks while at the same time still sitting in Germany. Yeah. So th there's lots of new technology coming, which will, which will, um, um, which will be great for our, for our business. And that is something that I can do now as, as I'm a late entrepreneur that you say. So I have 37 years of experience of, of my, my job and still I have like 10 years technology ahead. Yeah. This is an unbelievable freedom, you mm -hmm. know, to do something completely new. And I want to do new things in my life. Well, that, that's, that's one of the last questions I do want to ask. Everything you've talked about from just starting your career as a tailor and then being curious about doing new things, what made continuous learning such a priority for you in your career? I think I was, a, I, I'm a curious person by nature. I was always a curious person. I, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I was 10 years old and I got a, a, a big clock. Uh, as a gift and it didn't survive the day because I opened it completely and I wanted to understand how things are made and how it is made. So it, I crashed it. So in other words, my, I have an infinite curiosity about new things. And I think this is just going on. I literally think now about 
driving with, with my wife in Norway with a motorhome. Mm-hmm. And then from time to time stopping and making consultancy digitally, because as long as I have internet, I can do this everywhere. So I'm, 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 I'm really trying to always sense what's, what's going on in the future and how, what's my role in this? Like, mm-hmm. who am I in this kind of future? And I'm certainly not the person that I'm now. Sure. That is what drives me, I say. No, that's cool. I love the I love the driving around in Norway example and working from anywhere. It's yes. it's funny. We our our guest last week was uh, from Sweden, actually. So Scandinavia keeps coming up on this podcast as of late. I don't <laughs> I don't quite know why, but uh, no, this has been uh, because a, of the nature. <laughs> I, yes, I, I, yes, the, the the skiing, the outdoors. I I still yes. need to visit myself. I, I I haven't been yet, but no, you've you've crafted a really cool career for yourself, Joachim, and it's been excellent having you on the show. Is there anything you wish I would have asked you that, that we didn't get to in this conversation? No, the only thing that sometimes happens, sometimes people connect me so much with technology that I, I must add here that mm-hmm. there's no way that you can digitize a nice beer with a friend. <laughs> <laughs> well no way. said, well said. Yes. I, uh, Hopefully, whether you come over to the U.S. or I make my way over to Europe again, we'll get a chance to yes. to have that beverage, whether it's beer, wine, or whatever it is. I, whatever, I look, yeah. yeah I, I look forward to that day. What's the best way to connect with you, um, whether that's social media or your website? I, I'd say probably the easiest way to is to get on my LinkedIn um, account. You find me on LinkedIn and and just get in touch with me, and uh, and then we keep it from there. We 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 move it. In, this is the easy, I'm an easy approachable person. Absolutely. Well, I've se- I see you on LinkedIn all the time. For anyone mm-hmm. out there listening that's looking to learn more, Joachim's always hosting great webinars around digital transformation. I think you're getting over a thousand people signing up and showing had, up yes. to these. Yeah, <laughs> yes. no. So you're you're crushing it right now. You've been, uh, it's been excellent talking to you on the show and uh, looking forward to that beverage down the line, Joachim. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and to you, Prost, as well. Yes, exactly, Prost. Hey, hey, to everyone out there. As always, thank you for listening to this podcast, and a big thanks to Joachim for jumping on today's show. I actually learned about Joachim six months or so ago through the Industry 4.0 Club. If you're not familiar with Industry 4.0 Club, as a side plug, make sure to check them out. They're a group that's big over on LinkedIn and Clubhouse. Great group for networking within this industry. But I've been excited to hear Joachim's story in more depth, and I hope you enjoyed it today as well. As I mentioned at the start, if you want to learn how to work with Joachim and his consulting firm, head on over to manufacturinghappyhour.com 68. It's a great spot to find him on LinkedIn as well. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving that five-star rating and review over at Apple Podcasts. Again, you can get there by going to manufacturinghappyhour.com iTunes, and that'll take you there on your desktop or on your iPhone, where a review can be as short as a couple sentences. And with that, that is a wrap for this week. Short and sweet on the outro. Looking forward to seeing you back here next week. Stay innovative. Stay thirsty. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Manufacturing Happy Hour. Powered by the Industrial Network.